Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Before we introduce this week's guest, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a great way to support everything Cool Tools does, including our newsletters, podcast, video channel, and our flagship review website. This week, we want to give a shout out to Charles Cowens and David Siu. To become a patron of Cool Tools yourself, visit patreon.com slash cool tools. Our guest this week is Jordan Calhoun. Jordan is the deputy editor of Lifehacker and author of the upcoming book, Piccolo is Black, a memoir of race, religion, and pop culture. And uh, it was really cool because uh, I think a few weeks ago, Jordan interviewed us for the Lifehacker podcast. So now it's our turn to ask Jordan questions. How's it going, Jordan? I'm doing really well. I'm happy to be on the other side of the chair. Yes, excellent. So looking forward to your picks, um, knowing all the stuff that you see. Um, Can't wait to hear some of your favorites. Yeah, happy to walk people through them. Yeah, it looks to me like the list looks like a a very like pandemic inspired (laughs) list of (laughs) list of things to talk about. Two things I would say: it's very much pandemic inspired, and it's also inspired by my love of pop culture. Obviously, that's what I'm writing the book on, and. A lot of what I spend time writing and thinking about is related to entertainment and how it sort of molds our personalities and how it molds our experience in the world and how we use it to have conversations with one another. So all of my picks are in some way related to entertainment and the conversations that they help us have with others. Okay. Very cool. That that makes sense. What's the first one? Tell us about your number one. Okay. So the first one I have on the list is called Just Watch. Have you heard of this? I am a no. big fan of Just Watch. You probably know, uh, Kevin, more about Just Watch than I do. You know how they say that you only use you know, 10% of your brain. I don't know how true that is, but I feel that I only use about 10% of Just Watch and that there's a whole world that, that you can get from it. So Just Watch as a site is something that you can use to search for TV and movies across streaming platforms. One thing that's sort of missing in my streaming life or was missing before I got to just watch was being able to know if there's a certain movie that I'm looking for, where I can find it. You know, you can obviously Google it just sort of one off. And sometimes you'll find lists that are outdated because those things change all the time, right? You'll see something that's going to be on Netflix or Hulu one day will not be there the next month. So since it's always transient, it's really annoying to have a to not have a centralized place to be able to find this stuff. And Just Watch is a centralized place. So if I wanted to find out where to watch, you know, Face Off, one of the greatest action movies of the 90s, I would be able to just plug that into Just Watch and it'll tell me where exactly it's available, where it's streaming, where I could buy it, all of that type of thing. Right. I, I, I think of it kind of like your uh, streaming movie search engine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very succinct, accurate way of describing it. Some people, do you, do you have a, a just watch account? Do you use it to, is, no, can I don't. it be used I just, to track your viewing? No, I, I'm, I'm with you on the 10% <laughs> of, yeah. of the capabilities. I use it just to find out where in the world I can stream something. I've heard about right. something and I want to know where can I watch it? I, yeah. W- but in just watch it says, oh, it's streaming on Hulu or here's on Amazon for two dollars, whatever it is. So that's what it. Yep. I use it for. Yep. It'll. It's a great database for telling you where you can stream for free a certain thing that you're looking for, and you know how much would it cost if you're going to rent it from Amazon Prime or whatever site you use to rent things from. It's also really good for recommendations, so you can tell just watch the type of mood that you're in or the types of things that you really enjoy, and if you give it enough preferences, then it'll spit out things that are related to those. So if you're, you know, it's Valentine's Day, and if you're interested in watching certain romance movies, you can choose of a list of Valentine's Day movies or romantic comedies or romances, what it is that you like. And then it'll tell you things that are comparable and it'll give you some context on why they feel it's comparable. So it's a really good discovery tool that's absolutely great if you find yourself spending a lot of time with sort of the the 
paralysis that comes with how much choice we have and what it is that we can watch. But there are other ways to use it. Yeah, there are other ways that I like again that I haven't even t- tapped into. Like I use it as that search engine tool and to get recommendations. I don't know if it tracks what it is that you watch, like if you can sort of log what it is that you're watching or if it'll give you sort of long-term recommendations. Again, I I've been using it for a very specific purpose to which I think it does right. better than anything else that I found. Yeah, you're right. I haven't found anything else like it. So it's yeah. on my, I'm surprised my that like with Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, like knowing what you watch, that their recommendation engine or whatever would do a better job. But there seem to be like uniformly terrible. Well, there's an inherent flaw in it because they are only going to recommend things that are on their platform. So mm-hmm. there are plenty mm-hmm. of times that I'm watching an anime or I'm watching a drama and I'm thinking, you know, like, this is something I really enjoy. What else is available? Or I'll think of like, oh, I wonder if they have this other movie that I thought of. Sometimes it can even be a sequel to the movie that I'm watching. And you, if you're on a particular platform and you look and you find out like, oh, they don't have the rights for it this month or they had the rights for it previously, but it's not there. It'll give you recommendations saying like, well, if you like this title, you'll also like these other things. But their list of recommendations is going to be inherently smaller than everything that's out there on the other platforms. And yeah, just watch is agnostic right. to where it is. So just having that, you know, that agnosticism to platform, it'll just have a wider range of options to give you like more honestly what it is that you're looking for rather than just saying yeah. hey we want to keep you in our in our small little isolated universe of what we have the rights to that makes sense yeah i wonder if yeah. someday we'll have our own the kind of um what's the word we want portable um recommendation agent that works for us and that we can kind of carry around I mean, carry around like from one platform to another that does exactly that. That basically it watches what we're watching, and then it makes its own recommendations, sharing the same kind of information with other people. Mm-hmm. In an yeah, open source way. That would be really cool. That would. Hey, hey Jordan. Um, you mentioned that you watch anime. Does Just Watch include stuff on Crunchyroll and Funimation? It does. At least I'm ninety nine point nine percent that it does. I'll give it a try right cool. now while we're talking. I'm going to give a search oh, for okay. Attack on Titan, for example. Um, and yep, it's on here. There's four seasons available on Hulu and four seasons available on Funimation. There's three seasons available on Crunchyroll. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on Google Play. So yeah, it's pretty comprehensive there. So far, I have yet to have an experience where I was searching for a title that I was curious about and it just didn't have information on it. So far, it's been the most comprehensive that I have come across. So if there's anything better, then I'd love to find it. But for now, Just Watch has answered uh, a really big problem that I had in looking for what I wanted to watch. I wonder if it, um, I've been recently turned on to Canopy. Does I wonder if it indexes Canopy as well. Uh, it, be, I'm that's... 99.9% it does. Okay, cool. I'm pretty sure. Like I was, the, I was using this yesterday looking for a movie and some of the things that it was referencing, like where I could find this movie, were streaming sites that I had never even heard of. Well, like, cool. That's great. Okay. Comprehensive. That's, uh, number one. That's fantastic pick. Thank you so much. What's yeah. um, number two on your list? So number two on my list is for people who are interested in starting podcasts or already have a podcast. There's a few ways that you could go about it if you want to start a podcast. The way that most people begin when they're first getting their feet wet is when, and I'm speaking specifically for distribution, you can go through the process with Apple Podcasts and with Spotify and with Stitcher and for NPR One and for all the different places that people listen to podcasts. And you can upload, you can, you can establish your relationship with that particular site and you can have a process for uploading your podcast there. If you do that, that is great. That is free if you have the time and capacity to do it. If you want to do it a whole lot faster and have a concentrated sort of streamlined place to do that for you, then I found Libsyn or any sort of podcast hosting type site is going to be worth the amount of money that you'll spend on it. So if you end up having one of these uh, distributors for podcasts, you can upload it once 
you'll set it up everything sort of the first time that you set up your podcast on this site and you'll choose which podcast apps you want your podcast to automatically go out to. So it takes the one time setup. And then from then on, whenever you upload a new episode, it will automatically push out to all of the different places that you would want your podcast to be published. So it'll automatically push out to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever else, without you having to, you know, manually go to Google Play and then manually, manually go to Apple podcast and then manually go to Stitcher and manually go to Spotify. And then there's obviously going to be, you know, metrics and things that you could track, but it's a way to just have a streamlined process for distributing your podcast and, and making sure that you're casting a wide net. There's so many different apps out there and so many different sites and places where people sort of have their preference for where they like to listen to podcasts. And to be able to capture that wide net, you're either going to spend a lot of time building, you know, creating an account with each one of them, or you can just have someone do it for you. And the someone that I've used in the past has been Lipson, and that has been an excellent resource. And it's entirely, it's a whole lot faster than doing it the long way. Of course, there's sort of a, a cost comparison sort of analysis that you'll have to do, weighing the time that it takes for you to do it yourself versus the money that you would spend to pay someone to do it for you. I would say for a regular, so the amount that you pay will be based on the size of your podcast or the frequency, like the amount of storage space that you take. So if you have mm -hmm. a podcast that's, you know, once a month that, you know, that's an hour long episode or something like that, you're probably going to end up spending, I don't know, five or $10, however much it is just to give you a ballpark range. And if you had a really long podcast, let's say you had an hour long podcast that was, you know, every week, that's going to be a, lar a larger file size. You'll probably need more space for them to host it. And you might end up paying, I don't know, 20, 15, $20 a month. So it depends on how much uh, the size of your file or how much you'll end up paying. But if you have the capacity to do that and the money to spend on it and you want to get your podcast out to a wide audience, using a hosting site is a great way to do it. Is is there any a disadvantage to having your podcast go out to dis, additional channels? I mean, w wouldn't you want your podcast to go out to every single available channel everywhere? Generally speaking, yes, for those people whose motivation for having a podcast is to acquire listeners. There are some people who, you know, might have a podcast with their kids and they just want it to be listened to by family or friends or someone close. Their, their interests might not be actually low, like, you know, what we normally think of as wanting to build an audience and wanting to have, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of listeners. So if your goal is just to have a small time podcast for your friends or for your family or for your kids or for, you know, whoever, then you might not want to bother, you know, investing time into going to every different distributor and investing money into a hosting site or something like that. But if you are in it, like a lot of people are, to build an audience, then there's not much downside to casting a wide, as wide a net as possible and making sure that your podcast is available wherever people listen. You always hear that at the end of podcasts where people are like, you know, download and rate us and review us wherever you listen. Well, wherever you listen is a very broad place when it comes to the podcast world. And if you use a distributor, then you'll make sure that your podcast is more likely to be in all those places. I like that idea of having a podcast that's just for like family or a, a small group of friends. That's kind of a cool idea. Yeah, I haven't heard about those. Um, are you aware? Oh, of yeah. So, so, yeah, so well, <laughs> how, how, how does that work? Someone decides that they want to tell stories about old times, family vacations. And so they're going to do tell stories and then the relatives are all in on the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you hit the nail on the head there. So I actually first heard of this idea. Well, I guess it was last year now, uh, 2020. I heard of this idea because we wrote about it on Lifehacker on one of our, one of our, uh, one of our verticals is called offspring and it's focused on parents and parenting. And a thing that's sort of, become popular as a fun thing to do is to host a podcast with your kids. And if you're hosting a podcast with your kids, if you're doing that as a, you know, a bonding experience and to, you know, get them learning how to use a computer or how to, if you're using it as sort of a, a speech practice to get them talking or to get them more comfortable with conversation, all of those type of things, then 
yeah, you, you might not be in it for a huge audience. You're not really looking for a million people to discover your kid and to listen to them, but you're doing it the same reason that you might have a family photo album. Like not everything is Instagram. Not everything is to put it out there to get a million likes or to get a lot of attention. Some things are just going to be for you and your kids and your grandma and, you know, whoever else wants to listen, who's in your sort of private or smaller circle. And if you want to put things out there that way, then yeah, you might not really care about building an audience. And then, and, and that's perfectly okay. You know, there, there, that means that there's a uh, different decisions that you'll probably make in terms of how much investment you're going to put into the microphone and the headphones and in distribution and everything else. And if you can do that on the cheap and without spending money on distribution and stuff, then by all means have a ball. Like it's absolutely great to do. That's really great. I love great that. Idea. Yeah. So, so lip sync is the, um, one of several, uh, podcast hosting in, in the, in the realm of podcast hosting, is it uh, particularly, um, better than others or is it just one that you happen to know or how, how does that sit in the landscape of podcast hosting services? That was the one that was most recommended to me by a few people who have larger podcasts than uh, than I do. I mean, we have a pretty big podcast and I've produced a good share of them and I was doing it the old way, the simple way, or I mean, I guess simple, but but time, the, dumb way, the, uh, dumb way. Yeah, the, 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 the inefficient way for sure of like, <laughs> like going to Apple Podcasts and then going to Google Play and then going to each of them one by one. And when I was looking for a podcast hosting site, uh, Libsyn was the one that made the most sense. I bet there are plenty, like I, I am not paid by Libsyn, so I'm not very, uh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty agnostic. I, I imagine that there's a lot of other services that are very similar. I know popular places like Squarespace has podcast hosting, DreamHost has hosting, um, there's, I'm sure like Wix and most website building platforms will probably have a podcast hosting element to it that works pretty well. Libsyn is just one of the few that's a company dedicated entirely to podcasting. You know, there's, there's not much else that they're involved with. There's also like Buzzsprout. I know that that's one that focuses on podcasting and Podbean, I think is another one. So. Basically, people can browse around, see which ones work for them, compare prices, see what they prefer. My experience with Libsyn has been nothing but a positive one. But if someone, you know, was using another one that they heard that was recommended, I, I imagine that, you know, the top three or four of them are pretty comparable. Okay. Thank you. So um, that's great. In this string of um, media tools, um, you have another one to suggest for us. Yes. And this one is very much related to the pandemic for me. Something that has happened in my life since I've, you know, I live in New York. I live in this small apartment. I, since the pandemic started, I haven't traveled much and I haven't seen my friends and my family physically as much, but there's been something that's made me feel as if I've seen them really often. And that has been interacting with them and playing video games together and being able to see them on Twitch while we do it. And are, have you guys ever used Twitch before? I have stood over my son using Twitch. Yes. Okay. And that's going to be pretty common. Anyone's children at this point will be more familiar with Twitch than, than most parents. Most of your kids, you know, have, have you've seen them watching other people play video games. And there's two primary places that you've probably seen them watch video games one of them being YouTube and the other one being Twitch. They're basically competitors at this point. There's YouTube Live where people will stream and then there's Twitch where people will stream their video games. The thing with Twitch is that it's evolved from being something that's only basically used for streaming video games to now being a site that's for a lot of, a lot more things, including if someone's recording a podcast and they want to stream that podcast live, what they might do is do the live stream interview on Twitch and then later have that audio and make it into a podcast. There's also game nights that people can play together if you're playing an online game and it's something that strangers can jump in and participate in or be a part of the audience. Like if you were, I don't know if you ever played Jackbox and those type of games where you're playing with 
other people online doing trivia, for example, but other people can weigh in on your answers or other people can cheer or other people can vote on who had the best answers, things like that. Those things can happen on Twitch. Um, there's sort of talk shows that people will do on Twitch where it's someone looking at the camera, sort of like Instagram Live, but with a better setup and more features. So if you've ever sort of wanted to watch or if you've ever enjoyed a live podcast or an Instagram Live, Twitch is that same type of thing, except people have great layouts. They have means of, there's a chat so people can interact in the chat and there's no shortage of things to watch of, of strangers. I don't use it as much to watch strangers play video games or to watch podcasts and things like that. I do sometimes, but the main thing that I've been using it for during the pandemic is being able to have my friends on camera while I play PlayStation and being able to have my microphone on and they have their microphone on and we see each other and we get the type of interaction and experience as close as possible to what we might have if it weren't a pandemic and if we were just hanging out together and playing video games and having a conversation. So it's been a really good way to stay in touch with people over a shared experience aside from just you know, looking at each other and having a conversation over a Zoom call. So, so um, YouTube is generally free. Uh, is Twitch? Uh, do you need to have an account, and you need to pay for the account? And, you don't uh, need an account. Um, you can just go to TwitchTV.com, and you will see no shortage of things that are live streaming at the time. If you do, if you want to stream yourself, then you would make an account. But you could just drop in and watch whatever you want. Um, there is a financial element for people who want to subscribe to support a, a, a specific streamer. So it's become popular now, as with YouTube or Instagram or any of these social media type platforms where there are streamers that end up becoming really, really popular and monetize it and make a whole lot of money. There are a lot of gamers who make money on Twitch by just having very, very popular streams. Obviously, that's very rare. It's as rare as, you know, the stories that you've heard of this, you know, a, a random 12-year-old doing unboxing videos on YouTube and becoming a millionaire off of it. Like, it, it's, it's, it's uncommon. That's not going to happen for a normal person. But there are people who monetize their Twitch stream and can make money off of that. And, and that's based on people subscribing. Is there anybody who is taking like Twitch or live streaming and actually say doing um, home repairs or making or fixing things? Because I th I think that might be kind of interesting to to yeah. watch if they were really I good. At I I would be surprised if there wasn't. So I I've seen shows. Um, I've seen cooking shows, for example, on Twitch. I've seen some like arts and crafts shows on Twitch. I don't know if there's any like. I mean, I, I, I would assume that there is, but I, I can't say for sure. Actually, I can do a quick look of, of like home repair, like serious home repair type things like plumbing. And stuff. I, 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 the only reason that there might not be that yet is because the type of people who probably have that skill set are the same type of people that don't know Twitch exists. Like that's that's right. my guess. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the anyone that, doesn't overlap. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's not a big overlap there. Like the type of guys and the type of gals that you might, the type of people that you would imagine as the ones who are going to be, you know, fixing a toilet, usually aren't the ones that are streaming how to fix a toilet. Sort of why cer certain YouTube channels have blown up actually recently from people, yeah, teaching that type of thing in a way that's like, oh uh, man, there's one YouTuber whose name is. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but it's basically like he's the internet's dad, and he he basically teaches a lot of like you know how to shave and home improvement and all the stuff that your dad might have taught you how to change oil, the type of stuff that you know your cliche dad would have taught you, but that you might not have learned from your dad, or if you didn't have a father, if you didn't have someone who was teaching you that type of thing. And he went completely viral and really popular on YouTube. I imagine the same type of thing is on on Twitch if it's not all like it it'll be on twitch if it's not already right right okay um so uh so it has two uses one as a consumer where you can watch others and two if you want to stream uh, again to your friends while you're playing games or presumably something else i mean do people do board games that way um 
mean, wouldn't do board. They wouldn't do physical board games that way. I mean, like, like you probably could if you had a camera set up that way, but it just wouldn't be practical. Instead, what they would do would be an online game. So if I wanted, to, you know, if I wanted to stream a game of chess with someone, I wouldn't physically use a chess board and point my camera at it. What would we do instead? We would play online and we would play an online game of chess and there, there would be some fancy layout of the chess board that people are looking at. And on one side of the fancy chess board, it would be me on video. And on the other side of the fancy chess board, it would be you on video. And then people are watching that. They're seeing our reactions. They're seeing us thinking. They're seeing us, you know, play whatever it is that we're playing. And they're then as well, like watching the board and watching our pieces move. Do people play cards that way? I'm pretty sure. Like I, I would, I would be astounded if that weren't the case. Like any any type of entertainment game type stuff, uh, it's it's streamed on Twitch. Like I've tuned into no shortage of Dungeons and Dragons games, for example, or conversations about Dungeons and Dragons, or conversations about video games or people playing video games. That type of stuff is what twitch was originally for and now it's just getting to the point where it's evolving even broader than just video games to things like yeah potentially diy home improvement type shows and cooking shows and other things that people just want to be able to broadcast their lives and create content to engage with people okay all right um so um let's hear about um the fourth um pick all right. So the fourth pick is one to track your reading habits. And it's the most popular one, I would say, by far. There are alternatives if you want to find an alternative. And I'll explain why people might want to do that. But that site is Goodreads. Are you, do you guys have Goodreads accounts? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. OK, awesome. Yeah. Yes. So Goodreads, it started, whoo, man, I, I was in... I was one of the early adopters of Goodreads when it was an independent company and it was back over a decade ago and it started as just an online bookshelf. That's what most people used it as when they first got on, a way to just keep like track of their reading. Books. Exactly. If I if I read, you know, 30 books this year and want to look back to see what I thought about them, that's what Goodreads would be used for. And since then, Goodreads was bought by Amazon. And with that Amazon money, it became a whole lot of things. At its core, it's still an online bookshelf, but there's a whole lot more that comes with Goodreads now, now that it has, now that it's part of Amazon. So there's book giveaways that happens. People use it as a way to, for, as a discovery tool to find things to read, to get recommendations. Um, people write reviews there. People write a lot of reviews there. It's, it's powerful and important enough that the success of a book is probably more affected by its rating on Goodreads than it would be on Amazon. Um, or how about the New York Times? The New York Times. I mean, I, I would, I would. Ooh, that that's a great question. I'm wondering the effect of the effect of a Goodreads, like the impact of a Goodreads rating versus. Uh, you know, a, a feature in the New York Times. I think the the most important thing I would say, would, like a, a a positive review or a positive page on Goodreads, probably pales in comparison to having, um, you know, to being listed on the New York Times bestseller list. But Goodreads is definitely a place that people go to log their books and to find out what their friends are reading and what their friends thought about books. And early on, and this is something that I continue to use Goodreads for is they've always had this feature where I list the books that I read. You guys can list the books that you read. And if I wanted to, I could click on your profile. I could find this feature that says compare books. And then I could say, I could see like, these are the books that Mark read that I also read. And this is what Mark thinks about those books versus what I think about those books. So if we both, if there's any overlap in our Venn diagram of reading habits, I could say, oh, Mark loved this book and I hated it. Or Mark hated this book and I loved it. And it'll give you a percentage of how similar your reading tastes are. So I could know whether I want to accept a recommendation from Mark based on our reading tastes, tastes being so similar. Oh, we read so many of the same books and we thought the same thing about them. If he's recommending me this book, I am probably 
it's, it's a fair bet that he's right, that it's something that I'm going to enjoy. On the other hand, if I'm looking and comparing myself to Kevin and his books, you know, we only have two books in common because we clearly don't read the same things and we rated them vastly different. Then it's like, oh, okay, I have an idea of his reading taste. I have an idea of my reading taste. And it's a good way to interact with literature and reading while also interacting with your friends and seeing what they think about what it is that you're reading. Is, is that how you would use it? You would look for someone with a high, I don't know, relational score, and you would say, and then you would look to see what other books they have read that you haven't read. Opposite. I would actually look to see people who I am friends with. So my my friendship with people matters most, and this is for me personally. Some people go looking for like power reviewers and people who are who just read a lot, and they try to find recommendations for those people. I would rather find my friends first, or people who I know, or people who I care about. And then look at their profiles and see, you know, how similar our tastes are or what they're reading at the time. If I want to read something similar and there's different bookshelves that everyone categorizes their books under. So you can put it as read or you can put it as something that you want to read and just sort of plan your reading accordingly. So I use it as a virtual bookshelf still at its core. Some people use it as a virtual bookshelf, but also use it as a tool to find new books and for recommendations and for discovery. Some people use it as sort of a journal to log what it is that they thought about books and to review that way. And it's a really excellent tool. There are several other sites that are that do more or less the same thing. Um but there, none of them are, are as big as Goodreads. But there has been a shift where people have been looking for alternatives if they're sort of, you know, against Amazon and they don't, you know, they, they don't want to be a part of the Amazon ecosystem or it's gotten too convoluted or there's too much. There are, there are more bare bones alternatives to Goodreads for people who basically want the same functionality without the glut of information and tracking and advertising and all the stuff that comes with Amazon. And how does uh, Readwise fit into that? Readwise, I haven't used Readwise. Readwise is really great for uh, if you if you do a lot of reading on the Kindle. What it does is, anytime you make a highlight in your Kindle book, it saves it, and then you get a daily email that gives you sixteen of your highlights. And so it really helps if you start to have like hundreds of highlights from dozens or hundreds of different books, and it presents those highlights to you. And for me, it's like this great thing of like books that I've read years ago, seeing Mm -hmm. these passages that I highlighted, it's like, wow, I I can't even remember highlighting this, but it's like such a interesting um, excerpt from the book. And uh, it's a great way to just kind of refresh your memory about all these interesting things you found in books. And and again, this is kind of like... uh, the streaming video thing you mentioned earlier, I only know about 10% of it. There's a lot more uh, behind Readwise, a lot of powerful things. It's really cool. But it's, it yeah. sounds almost like a feature of what, I mean, the, a feature that should be on Goodreads. So there, I think the closest equivalent to that for Goodreads is that there is a quotes feature where you could basically sort of like other people's quotes that are attributed attributed to famous people, you know, Oscar Wilde or Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe or, or Malcolm X or whatever. So you can save, you can sort of reply to quotes and mark them as your favorite and they'll be a part of your favorite quotes on your profile. I think you can add quotes and they'll be listed under my quotes, but that's one of the, that's like a, a, a I, I would guess that's like one of the bottom 10 features that people would use on Goodreads <laughs> if they were to like, you know, rank their hierarchy of what they use Goodreads for. So that's not the main function of it. So Mm -hmm. I imagine that that feature on Goodreads, being able to track quotes, isn't going to be on par with this alternative that sounds like it's made specifically for that and then has other features beside it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But that's um, amazing. I'll check that out. Yeah. Do you read most of your things on Kindle at this point or are you still a paper book reader? I'm still a paper book reader for the most part. Part. The only time that I use an e-reader is when I'm traveling because it's a lot easier, obviously, to carry that around than to carry, you know, four or five books or something if I'm going to be gone for a long for a long time. Obviously, that hasn't been the case during the pandemic for me. 
So I don't think I've read a single book on an e-reader since the pandemic began. Actually, I'm confident in saying that. I haven't read a book on a Kindle or on a Nook. I have both of them for some reason, for no good reason. Um, but I haven't read one on an e-reader since since the pandemic started. All my books are just here and I don't really go anywhere. What about you? Are you guys more e-readers or, or books or both? I'm, I'm a both. I think most people are both. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think I prefer to read, um, on, uh, paper and cause I, I mark things. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. find the marking functions still a little behind using a pen on paper. Um, yeah. But, but the, of course the retrieval on paper is terrible. It's just abysmal, and I'm right. sometimes I'm not sure why I'm doing it. But um, so it's easy to do and hard to retrieve for, on paper, <laughs> whereas it's really harder to do on uh, you know electronic, but much easier to retrieve. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Pros and cons there. I think for the lifestyle yeah, that I'm really currently are. living, for the lifestyle I'm currently living, it's it's paper books. Like if I you know if I had the choice, I'm going to choose a paper book. Usually, it's like I would have to look for a reason to use the e-reader. Like I'm going to be on the move and I don't want to carry something heavy. Yeah. So Jordan, speaking of books, why don't you tell us about the book that you're working on right now? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm writing this memoir called Piccolo is Black, a memoir of race, religion, and pop culture. And the book is about basically my time growing up and forming an identity in a particular context. And that context is one of a deeply religious family and also one where I loved pop culture as a kid. I loved cartoons. I loved anime. I loved comic books. I still love those things. But it was growing up in a time where those things did not have very diverse representation. So there's a certain mental gymnastics that kids like me went through when we were young people of color that didn't see many people of color on TV is that we started to identify specifically black people. So I'll speak for myself. I'm black and I would start to see, and a lot of my friends and a lot of people just across the black experience started to see race where race wasn't explicitly written in a character. And there's certain attributes of characters that would assign them to us as, as black. And some of them I think were known by the writers and I've interviewed quite a few writers that sort of, you know, had that intention. And there's been quite a few writers who didn't have that intention at all. I'll give you an example. I don't know how much, you know, cartoons you guys watch growing up, but did you ever watch a Goofy movie, for example, or Doug sure. or Dragon Ball Z? I, I miss those. Okay. So if, if your Mark, listeners... You might, you, might, you might have seen them. So, so could you kind of explain it for the benefit yeah, of yeah. like me? Absolutely. So... For listeners who, you know, have watched a Goofy movie, for example, there's a character named Max who is this like outcast kid whose principal is looking at him as this kid from the wrong side of the tracks. And he's basically to what uh, a young kid is looking for. Like he's not he's anthropomorphic. He's like Goofy is a dog and his kids and his family are all mm -hmm. dogs. So they, they, they don't have a race, but the way that he's characterized. Someone like me would be watching that as a kid and think, oh, yes, he's clearly black. He is intended to be black. Same thing with uh, there's other certain characters like Nickelodeon. There is Disney had a show called Doug. And even if you didn't watch the cartoon, I'm sure you've seen Doug before just by nature of being mm -hmm. alive and walking this earth. <laughs> um, so there's a character named Doug and his best friend is a character who's blue. His name is Skeeter. And people aren't blue. Skeeter didn't have a real race, but it was pretty clear that Skeeter was not white, like Doug was white and blue people don't exist. And that Skeeter was representative of the black best friend that was really common when I was growing up. There's a lot of pop culture. If you watched in the eighties and nineties, there would, you know, as, as things sort of started to tiptoe towards diversity, there would be, you know, Alicia Silverstone and Clueless. And then there would be Stacey Dash as her best friend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's Skeeter as the black best friend. There was also, what was the other example that I mentioned? Dragon Ball Z. And this is what the character is named after. There's a character named Piccolo who was from another planet, who was this outcast. 
uh, in this outsider who was this good hearted alien, basically this person who ended up raising Goku's children, basically. There's other characters similar that come from other planets, like Marsh- Martian Manhunter from, from, uh, from DC comics. There's so many characters that depict or present themselves as people of color, or they were voiced by pe- people of color. I don't know if you watched the cartoon Gargoyles. It was running for a while. That was another cartoon that mm-hmm. the voice actors of Goliath, uh, the voice actor of Goliath was Keith David, a black man with a very distinct voice. Um, Elisa Maza was played by a racial woman. She was the, the, the co-star of the show. So the book basically, long story short, is about forming an identity in the context of pop culture where you're learning a lot about yourself through characters and you're learning a lot about race and you're doing certain mental gymnastics to try to make sense of the world through the stuff that entertains you as a kid, which is, you know, cartoons and entertainment. So, so, so I have so many questions. Um, (laughs) We'll see if I have answers. I know For, for one, um, I, I'm pretty sure that 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 your book is is focused on, say, American pop culture because yes. one of the because well, I'm well because I'm mostly, kind of like yeah. uh, I consider myself half Chinese at this point, but I mm-hmm. I just wonder about like you know pop uh, Korean pop and stuff like that. D- is 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 that is it also happening in other cultures where they can use the sort of the the cover of aliens or animals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to 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 do this. D- mm-hmm. Does that also happen in, in, in other cultures as well? And like, and what is the future of this? Do you, do you think that there's going to be more of this or mm-hmm. would there be less of it? So the answer to your first question is absolutely yes, with the caveat that the intention might have been different when, let's say, a Japanese person is creating this anime. It's hard for me to say with any degree of confidence whether they would have thought, for example, when they were creating Dragon Ball Z, that Piccolo would be this you know, outcast character that Black people would attach themselves to. Like, I, I doubt that that was the intention there. But in terms of its effect, the effect is the same. And it's definitely true that Black kids growing up, kids like me, loved anime. Like, it's very, very huge and very inf- influential. Um, video games, all the same and, and things that came particularly, uh, anime and video games that came from Japan. So like street fighter growing up, very, very large, very huge and popular in black culture in the nineties and two thousands through today with kids who would identify as nerds. And those are ones where, yeah, we would always be looking for race and finding those characters like you know dj and street fighter oh he's from jamaica this is the black character this is the one that we're going to you know recognize or try to see ourselves in so the answer to your first question is yes our interpretation of it or at least my interpretation of it would definitely extend beyond things that were created in the united states your second question was about the future of it i think and hope that the future continues to shift towards one where diversity is more of a primary thought than an afterthought. So if you were to watch things, you know, if you were to watch things, let's, let's go further back. If you were to watch, you know, Disney back when they had the Censored 11, for example, like they would have, or, or Warner Brothers, they don't even air these things anymore. They basically locked it in a vault. But there were very blatantly racist caricatures of black people back then that have been censored and sort of purged and like unavailable on on Disney Plus, for example. So there so there, there there's that stage. Then if you go a little bit further in our country's progress and in our moral progress, you get to a point where, okay, diversity is good and we will have a token person of color. And every now and then we'll have an ensemble cast where there's, you know, a few people of color. So you, you might, you know, have something like Captain Planet, for example, where there's, you know, there's going to be LeVar Burton. He's going to be the black kid who has heart, but there's also going to be an Asian character. There's going to be a Russian character. There's going to be an American character. There's going to be an Indian character. But generally speaking, I would say when I was growing up, that was when we were in the middle of the transition where there was basically a lot of tokenizing. There was a lot of, you know, we are going to throw in a black best friend. We're going to have Skeeter. Skeeter from Doug is who I'm referring to. Then, In the future, as we continue to transition, and I think we're moving in a great direction now, is by having thoughtful diversity, not just on the screen or on the page, but in terms of people who are creating it. 
So there's more authentic depiction. It's, it's not tokenizing anymore when, you know, a random white person is thinking, I am creating this, you know, Batman show and there has to be a black character. So I'm going to throw one in there and just do my best. Instead, it's going to be more genuine and we've seen more genuine diversity and we've seen cartoons with people of color behind the scenes or movies or TV shows with more diversity behind the screen and behind the page. And that's what's going to create for things that read a whole lot more authentic than the experience that I had growing up. So hopefully in the future, you know, my nephews right now who are young, they don't have to do the mental gymnastics that I had to do to feel represented in TV. They don't, they don't have to see something and, you know, scour the page or scour the screen for the character that represents them or that they can relate to by nature of their race or their life experience. They get a whole lot more of that because we're moving in the right direction. And hopefully we continue in that direction where we see uh, an entertainment landscape that's not just dominated by one type of hero or one type of character or one type of, you know, depiction or one race, but one where, you know, if, if I want my choice, we were talking about just watch earlier and being able to have a choice of things to watch. The best future that I see is one where there is a ton of choice and so much choice that that's the problem. You know, it's a happy problem to have to have so much choice in what it is that you want to watch and what experience that you want to have. And you're not starving for something that represents you and something that can entertain you. I, that makes sense? That too. I, I really hope for that too, as well. What a, yeah. a wonderful vision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jordan, I was going to ask you, do, do you watch forbidden Neverland? Um, are, are you talking about the anime? Yeah. Yeah, Promise yes. Neverland, I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I knew where you were going with that. Yeah, the second season just came out <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah, dark anime, man. Yeah. The second season just yeah. came out. Um, yeah. I believe it is available on Netflix, right? Is it Netflix yeah. or Hulu? Uh, well, we're watching it on uh, Crunchyroll, eagerly awaiting every Thursday. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, you know, when we first saw uh, Sister Crone, who's, mm -hmm. you know, the black character. Yes. I, I just, you know, we kind of like we're looking at that thinking it seems like kind of like racist stereotype. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, That's... you're 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 opening Pandora's box here. I had um, <laughs> I had that would be another episode if you if, if I'm fortunate yeah. enough to be invited back on one day. If you guys ever want to talk pop culture, we can go down that rabbit hole. I'll give you the short answer now, though, which is that it's a very challenging thing to watch anime sometimes as a person of color, because in my experience and in my perception, I was having this conversation with my friend B, who is also a, a lot into anime. She's a newer anime fan and she's loving it. She's been watching everything under the sun, just ripping through it. And she had to stop this show once that character was introduced because she just couldn't stomach it. And we had this conversation about, you know, do you look at that and try to hold it accountable the same way that you would an American? Like, would you say like, you know, they should know better? Or would you say, oh, it's a different culture and they didn't mean well? Like, do you judge it by their, what you presume their intentions might have been? Or do you judge it by the impact that it has and say that like, no, you know, even if they are another culture, they should know better that, you know, yeah. there's, there's no excuse for that type of lack of awareness. And I've, I've right. lived, I, I lived in Tokyo for a year. I've, I've spent a, a good amount of time there. And it's definitely something that is a struggle that people sort of have to make their, their personal opinion with. So that's sort of a, a non exact answer to your question. The answer that I'll give you is that it is something that's definitely noticeable and it's something that's challenging and it's something that people are beginning to have a different type of conversation about. I think everyone yeah. was a lot more forgiving 10, 20, 30 years ago about it than we might be now when you're feeling like, Ooh, is there an excuse yeah. for this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like really kind of uncomfortable. Seeing it's jarring. Crone like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty jarring. jarring and it's, it's, yeah. and, and unfortunately it's pretty common in anime to have, to see those type of depictions of people of color, you know, it's like just the big mm -hmm. different colored lips, the, the types of things that were, you know, now censored from Warner Brothers and, and Disney's depictions of black people having that sort of that that type of visual 
we know is like uncomfortable and blatantly racist and not okay. And yeah. the question is, how far do you apply that to other cultures? Do you expect that, that you know, are, are, are you gracious in saying that, no, maybe they don't know better or it's different or, you know, maybe their, their intention, their heart is in the right place. They didn't mean anything by it. Or do you say, mm, that's not an excuse anymore. They should know better. And there's, there's yeah. that's a personalized answer that we all have to make. Yeah, definitely. Well, Jordan, I wish we could, I mean, this, this was, is just the beginning of a, a conversation I would l love to continue, but we have to jump and start recording our next guest. But absolutely, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us. These are all great picks, great conversation. Thanks so much, Jordan. My pleasure. Thank you for having me and really enjoyed it. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. <laughs>